Hi, we're Harvest Kids. Did you know that we're on YouTube? Each and every week we film a church online experience for kids. Every week we worship together, we study the Bible, we play a game, and we do a craft or a snack. So we want to invite you and your family to join us each and every week. The kids are going to learn a lot about the Bible, but so are the parents. So we'll see you online. Hey everybody, my name is Jonathan Laurie and I want to welcome you to our Harvest at Home service. We are so stoked that you're joining us. My dad is going to be giving a great message from God's Word in just a few moments. But before we do that, I want to encourage you, if you haven't already, get your family in the room, tell them service is about to start, come sit on the couch, get ready uh, for a time of worship and a time of Bible study, get your pen and paper, all that stuff. And if you wouldn't mind, man, we'd sure love it if you would share this link with your friends. Let your friends, let your family know that service is starting. Uh, Harvest at Home is a great resource for people to hear about who God is and to hear about what His plan is for our life. Everybody wants to know, what's God's will for my life? What is my purpose in life? Listen, this program, I guarantee you, is going to give you some of those answers. And uh, while we're on the topic of things that we've made available as a church, as a ministry to you, we have a number of resources that we would love to offer you. The first course that we have made available to you is our New Believers class. Well, what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus Christ? Well, this course, New Believers, is just for you. It's gonna help you understand what it means to be a follower of Christ, some helpful and practical tips on how to be a follower of Him. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm pretty active and I like to go on walks. I like to spend time with family. We like to go hang out at the beach and walk around. Uh, I spend a lot of time in my car as well as I'm driving to and from work. But I found that whatever situation I'm in, if I've got a little extra free time, I like to throw those headphones in. I like to turn the uh, sound up in my car and listen to different podcasts, different teachers and different people that have things to say about topics that I'm interested in. Well, my dad has started a podcast called the Greg Laurie Podcast. And I tell you what, it is amazing. It's got a bunch of his teachings that he's given. And I tell you what, this is going to be a podcast that ministers to you because it's got God's word in it. It's got encouraging tips in it. It's got practical things that you can implement into your life on how to be a, a better Christian, a better husband, a better worker, a better father. And so uh, we would sure love for you to download this podcast off of our website. And then the last thing I wanna let you know about is my dad's daily devotion. This has been utilized by hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of people, honestly. Uh, it's amazing to see how many people are ministered to by my dad's daily devotion, which we make available to you through your email. It'll arrive in your inbox every morning before you wake up. And I tell you what, it takes you maybe a minute, a minute and a half to read through these. They are just enough to kind of get you jump started on your day, hear from the Lord, a great little tidbit of scripture to jump in on, and just an encouraging word. And so we would love to make that available to you. All of these resources that I have mentioned are available to you at no cost. Uh, they're our gift to you. We want you to grow in your faith because of this ministry. Well, hey, speaking of growing in your faith, uh, right now, we are about to jump into a time of worship, a time of Bible study. Harvest at Home is about to start, so we're so excited that you've joined us. Again, grab your pen, grab your paper, get ready, because it's going to be an awesome time worshiping our Lord together. Community looks a little different these days, doesn't it? Hi, morning, April. Hi, Ashley. But community is as important, if not more important, than ever before. In a small group, you are noticed. You know, sometimes you can slip in and out of church unnoticed, but in a harvest group, people will know your name and welcome your participation. In our homes, on our phones, with our families, and with each other, you're cared for, you're appreciated, and you're both wanted and needed in a harvest group. So I wanna personally encourage you as your pastor to be involved in a harvest group. It's studying the Bible more deeply in a community with other believers. Hey, I'm so confident you're gonna love the harvest groups. You'll stick with it even after that first month, but try it out. I think you're really gonna like it. Hey, welcome to Harvest at Home. I'm Greg Laurie and I have a message for you from the Word of God. We're studying the book of Revelation together and my message title is What Heaven Knows About Earth. I'll tell you one way to bring heaven down is through worship. So let's worship together. Then I'll look forward to sharing this message from God's Word with you. Again, 
Welcome to Harvest at Home.
upon our faith here in this place. Have your way. The moment that we see you, we are changed. Show us your glory. Show us your glory. In wonder and surrender, we fall down. Show us your glory. Show us your glory. Let every burning heart be holy to Well, that's a powerful song, isn't it? And show us your glory. And, and man, that's something we wanna see right now. I think in our nation, we wanna see it in the church. We wanna see it in the culture. And there was a time, well, it wasn't that long ago, uh, 
called the Jesus Movement. You know, a lot is said about the 60s and the 70s, but one part of the history that is left out is what God did during the last great spiritual awakening, which some historians regard as the greatest of all the revivals in American and perhaps global history because of the lasting impact it had, and that was the Jesus Movement. And as our special offer uh, this month, we are offering to our viewers their own copy of this book, Jesus Revolution. And I, I want you guys to know that this is not just a walk down memory lane and a nostalgic book. So the reason I wrote this book is to tell a story of revival to hopefully inspire a new spiritual awakening because it's been said the fame of revival spreads the flame of revival. Absolutely, and Greg, it's not just that book, but they're also offering this wonderful um, workbook curriculum that goes alongside with that and right. the video series yes. when you preached about uh, Jesus' revolution and what the significant um, elements that yeah. were taking place at that time that changed our generation. Yep. And just like that song, you know, Jesus, you change everything. And yeah. it began one life at a time. Yes. And uh, I think it's more than just hearing a sermon. It's really applying the principles yeah. of what we learn, and we can do that so well as we use this workbook and listen to the series with other people. So That's I think right. this is gonna be a great um, resource for everyone this month. And we got this amazing letter, um, one of the comments from someone who read this book. I love what um, she had to say. She said, um, so many things I didn't know and would never have known had I not read this book. She said, I cried thinking about how my mom and dad must have lived through a lot of this and how it probably helped shape them. And it made me inspired to look for a new Jesus revolution yeah. in our own times and what I can do to help. That's somebody who just didn't just hear about it and yeah. reminisce, but somebody who says, I want this now. Right. And the hunger that she has, she says, goodness knows our world could do with more Jesus. We're living in divisive times. We yeah. were living in divisive times. Yes. The, uh, so much of what is happening today currently in culture yeah. um, was similar and it had its seeds. Riots in the street, intense mm -hmm. racial tension mm -hmm. and, and much more. And it almost I, seemed like the country was coming unraveled. And young people really... Um, just being taken away into escapism yeah. and the use of drugs and yeah. you know even social media and all that. We didn't have that in right. those days, but it was this huge distraction yeah. for young people to not know their purpose. And yes. we felt that way. We were searching and, um, and the Lord found us. And in that time, how we discovered the yeah. truths of God's word right. and the Holy Spirit did such an amazing work. He, he filled us and he changed a generation of young people right. that are now old people. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. But old people that want to pass us on to yes. young people. Mm -hmm. You know, the psalmist says, will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? And I, I just was watching the news uh, last night. They said that like uh, self-harm is up dramatically. Depression is up substance abuse is up in these days of COVID with all this lock-in uh, activity happening. And I think it's a great time for us to be looking to the Lord and we're saying, Lord, do it again. So here's the deal. We wanna offer you a copy of this book, Jesus Revolution, along with a workbook where you can do a little Bible study and there's a video teaching series that we'll send you a link to for your gift of any size. And when you support us, you enable us to continue to bring this ministry to you called Harvest at Home and our other outreaches that we do. We have some very exciting things in store for the future, but if you would like to support our ministry, get your own copy of the Jesus Revolution workbook and book. There's information on the screen and just follow those directives and we wanna thank you in advance. So we're gonna continue to worship the Lord right now. So why don't you pray for us as people a gift toward our ministry. Lord, we are so grateful that 
you didn't just work in times past, in historical times, or even in, um, in the 60s and 70s, but you're at work today. Amen. And God, you can do it again. You want to fill our hearts and our lives and our minds with your Holy Spirit. We thank you that your word is eternal and true. And as we are about to listen to it, we, pre- we pray that you prepare our hearts and that you will also bless those who are helping us get this mm-hmm. important message out to a, a hungry and a needy world. Amen. And we pray, Lord Jesus, that you you would use these resources to further your kingdom. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's continue to worship the Lord. For I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good. To me, before I took a breath, you breathe your life in me. You have been so, so kind to me. Holy, holy, never bending, reckless love of God. Chases me down, fights till the thought leaves the night and I couldn't work, I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself.
Well, that was a great time of worship, wasn't it? All right, let's have a Bible study together. Grab your Bibles and turn to Revelation chapter six. We're gonna look at two chapters together, Revelation six, Revelation seven. The title of my message is What Heaven Knows About Earth. We come to a new section in our series on the book of Revelation. And for the sake of an illustration, let me compare it to a film. Remember when we used to go to theaters, right? And we would take our seats. Now, I don't know about how you guys go to a movie, but for Kathy and I, it always involves popcorn and milk duds. I'm not sure how that started, those two things, but that's what we get popcorn and milk duds. Now, sometimes I'll say, Kathy, come on, the movie's starting, and there's a long line at the concession stand. This is all ancient history now, isn't it? And she'll say, but I have to get the popcorn. And I'll say, but Kathy, you don't want to miss the beginning of the film. You find out who the main characters are. The plot lines are being established, and she always shows up about four <laughs> four minutes late, and then she's saying, who's that? Why do they do that? I went, ah, oh, t- that's why you have to be there in the beginning of the movie. So if the book of Revelation were a film, we would now know who the main characters are, both good and bad. The hero appears in chapter one, and of course, it's Jesus Christ. The good guys are in chapters two to three. That's the church, that's us. Now the villain and his bad guys come barreling in in chapter six as the four ominous horsemen of the apocalypse. And now the real action of the book is beginning to build. Uh, The music is swelling in and we're sinking deeper into our seats. And I don't know about you coming back to theaters, but after I'd walk out of a theater, it was embarrassing to see how much popcorn I dropped on my seat and on the floor. I felt bad for the people cleaning it up. So now this is the big moment as the story continues on, and now we see conflict. In fact, it looks at this moment in the book of Revelation as though the bad guys are winning because we see wickedness taking hold as Satan rides roughshod over planet Earth The good guys are getting pummeled by the Antichrist. But, spoiler alert, Jesus Christ returns in the end and we win in the end, just in case you didn't know. So, Revelation chapters 6 to 19 are really the heart of the book. These chapters contain 21 judgments that will be unleashed on the world during the seven-year tribulation period. We have three distinct series of judgments that will befall planet Earth uh, during this time known as the tribulation. Basically, it's gonna be seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven bulls. Let me say that again. Seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven bulls. But let me say at the outset, God takes no pleasure in this. You know, sometimes people wanna portray God as angry, you know, with a lightning bolt in his hand, so excited about bringing judgment on planet Earth. Nothing could be further from the truth because the Lord says in Scripture, I take no delight in the death of the wicked. You know, sometimes people will say something along the lines of, well, I believe in the God of the New Testament, not the God of the Old Testament, because the God of the Old Testament is wrathful and angry, but the God of the New Testament is loving and gracious. Clearly, you have not read the Bible. Because yes, we see a God of holiness, we see a God of righteousness, but a God of love and a God of mercy in both the Old and the New Testament. Let's go back to the Old Testament as an example. We remember that the plagues came upon Egypt and upon Pharaoh. The Lord didn't wanna do that. Pharaoh was warned over and over by Moses to let God's people go, and he refused, and his heart got harder, but he had opportunity after opportunity to repent, and it was really on him. He had no one ultimately to blame but himself. Go to the story of Noah in the book of Genesis, when God sent the judgment through the flood. There was plenty of time for people to turn to God and to repent before one drop of rain fell. Again, the Lord took no pleasure in that. Another classic example of God being merciful in the Old Testament is the story of Nineveh. 
Remember, this was a city renowned for its wickedness, run by the Assyrians that were very cruel in the way that they uh, treated their enemies, uh, just unbelievable atrocities. And God warned them that judgment was coming, but the Lord raised up a prophet named Jonah, who obviously didn't want to go at first, but he eventually got there and he gave them the message, 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. But notice there was a warning first. And what happens? The people repent and God does not send judgment. There are positive aspects of the judgment of God, believe it or not. Number one, God's judgment frightens us. And that's not a bad thing. It's supposed to. Judge, God's judgment scares the hell out of us. And that's good to have the hell scared out of you. And it'll make you think twice before you do that thing. And as you watch uh, God's judgment or the repercussions come into a person's life when they've done the wrong thing, it's a warning to you to not also do the wrong thing. Number two, God's judgment sobers us. It forces us to reassess the way we've been living our lives. And sometimes it causes us to change our priorities. It's C.S. Lewis who wrote that pain is God's megaphone to reach a deaf world. The psalmist said, before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I have kept your word. So God can use these things to get our attention. Another thing about the judgment of God, it humbles us. It strips away our self-righteousness and reminds us of how sinful we are, reminding us that we're not in control of our own lives. And it reminds us that we desperately need God in our life. And one last thing about the judgment of God, it reassures us. Say, no, Greg, you got that one wrong. No, it reassures us. It reassures us that there'll finally be justice in the world. Every day we get up in the morning and we read news sites about horrible, unthinkable events that take place, crimes that are committed, horrible, sinful things that are done, and we think that's not right. But we remind ourselves, one day there's a final court of justice. That's what we're seeing unfold here in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter six is like a flyover of the whole book, starting with what we call the four horsemen of the apocalypse. We talked about this last time. Remember that the first horse is white and the rider is none other than the Antichrist. Not Jesus Christ, but Antichrist who inaugurates the tribulation period coming on a white horse that sort of looks like he's a good guy. And in the beginning of the tribulation period, he comes with overtures of peace and solutions to the economic problems of the world and much more, but then he shows his true colors, bringing us to the next horse, the red horse of war, because Antichrist was never a peacemaker. He always was a troublemaker, and he uses the offer of peace as a ruse to deceive people, and it appears as we read through the book of Revelation that God allows men to unleash his significant military might and nuclear weaponry. Closing time has come for our planet as we know it. And Antichrist begins to enforce his agenda on planet Earth and his so-called benevolence gives way to bloodthirsty vengeance on all who disagree with him. Following that is the black horse of famine and finally the pale horse that brings pestilence, famine, disease, and all the things that inevitably follow war. But now we come to a group of courageous believers who are put to death. People that would not take the mark of the beast. People that would not pledge their allegiance to the Antichrist. In fact, maybe even people that you have shared the gospel with that will miss the rapture but come to faith later. We read about them in Revelation 6, starting in verse 19. And when he opened the fifth seal... I saw under the altar the souls of them that have been slain for the word of God and for their testimony which they held. You might underline those two things or come back to them, to them again. They're slain for the word of God and the testimony they held. And they cried with a loud voice saying, how long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth. 
Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and of their brothers who would be killed as they were was completed. So we'll stop there. Who are these people that appear in heaven who've been put to death for their faith in Christ? These are people who have come to believe in Jesus during the tribulation period. Again, these are people who miss the rapture. These are people who refuse to take the mark of the beast. Why were they put to death? Two reasons are given. Look at Revelation 6, 9. They were slain for the word of God and for the testimony they held. Number one, they stood for the word of God. Number two, they had a powerful testimony. Let me ask you a question. Do you stand for the word of God? Do you speak up for what is true? Maybe people are saying things in a conversation that you know contradict what the Bible says. Do you have the courage to say, well, let me just offer my opinion, and the Bible says, it's funny, man, you bring a Bible out and people freak out, don't they? Just the very presence of a Bible alarms some people, but you may quote it because you have one nearby, or you may have memorized a verse, and you share what the Bible says, and then also they were put to death because of their testimony. Listen, every Christian has a testimony. Now the question is, is it a good one, or is it a poor one? A testimony is your story of how you came to faith in Jesus Christ. We read later in the book of Revelation, of people that overcame the devil, and we'll get to this in a future message that I'm calling How to Overcome the Devil, but we read that they overcame the devil by the blood of the lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives until the death. And so they used the blood of the lamb and their testimony. So your testimony, your story of how you came to believe in Jesus is a powerful bridge to start a conversation about your faith. You might even be surprised to know that uh, when I'm sharing my faith with people, I don't start with a sermon. I don't cruise around with a little pulpit like this on wheels, you know, that I have in the market and I'll stop and preach a sermon. Now, I usually start with my own story of how I came to believe in Jesus as a young kid at the age of 17 and what really got through to me. So they have their testimony and they're persecuted and if you stand for the word of God and if you're bold with your story of what Christ has done for you, you will face a degree of persecution. Uh, In fact, we're told in 2 Timothy 3.12, all who desire to live godly lives will suffer persecution. Now we come to the heart of this message. Remember, we're talking about what do people in heaven know about what's going on here on earth? Follow-up question, do they even care? Are people in heaven watching us right now? Are they looking down from glory and observing what we're facing and what we're going through? It seems there are two trains of thought on this subject. Some would suggest that when you're in heaven, the last thing you would care about is what is happening on earth. And to the point, if you knew of something tragic or sad that had happened on earth, it would ruin heaven for you. The other train of thought is people in heaven are watching our every move. They sometimes even intervene in our lives. Sometimes they speak to us and they guide us. Okay, you might be surprised to hear me say both of these views are incorrect and both of these views are not Biblical. So let me give you a biblical view of what people in heaven know about earth. Now, someone might be thinking, well, why why even talk about this? Who even cares? Well, you care if you have a loved one in heaven. Now, as you probably know, our son Christopher went to be with the Lord 13 years ago. He was only 33 years old. It was a life-altering event. I had a very close relationship with Christopher as I do with my son Jonathan. We talked every single day. And to suddenly have communication cut off and no longer be able to hear from them or talk to them or know what they're doing, it's like you've been cut off. And so there were two things I wanted to know about in the aftermath of my son's death. Number one, I wanted to know more about heaven. 
So I wouldn't say I'm an expert on heaven, but I would say I'm a student of heaven. And I would add this, I also wanted to know more about how I can bring hope when tragedy strikes. Because when you lose a loved one or when you find out that you're terminally ill or something huge happens to you, you wonder, how am I going to survive it? I wanted to know how I can bring hope to people like this because God brought hope to me in my hour of need. Because here's the bottom line. As you get older, you're gonna know more people that have gone on to heaven. You're gonna know more people who die. Some of you are thinking, yeah, thanks for that depressing thought preacher. Well, it's just reality. Someone's got to tell you, so I guess it's going to be me. Listen to this. Hate to break the news to you. Life is hard. It just is. But God is good. And God's going to give you what you need in life. So don't be afraid. He'll, he won't necessarily give you what you need before you need it. He'll never give it to you after you need it. He'll always give it to you when you need it. The Bible says he's a present help in time of trouble. So before we dig into this passage here in Revelation 6, let's think of some other passages that tell us a little bit about what heaven knows about earth. The first one that comes to mind is found in Luke 16. And here's the point I wanna make. People in eternity are aware of the fact that their loved ones are not saved. People in eternity are aware of the fact that their loved ones are not saved. Going back to Luke 16, it's a behind the scenes look at the afterlife. Some think it's a parable, but a parable's an illustration. This is a real story because names are attached and it's a story of two men. One was rich, one was poor. One had no interest in God, one believed in God. They both died. The rich man had a big funeral. It would have been on all the television stations. Everyone would have known about it. The poor man, nobody even cared about him. By the way, his name was Lazarus. And Lazarus lived from the food that fell from the rich man's table. So they both died and they entered into eternity. Lazarus, not the same Lazarus that Christ raised from the dead, by the way, but Lazarus in this story is immediately escorted by the angels into heaven, into what is called Abraham's bosom. The rich man, meanwhile, is sent down to Hades or a place of torment, and he's literally in flames. He realizes how horrible this is, and we read in 1628, him saying, I have five brothers and I want to warn them about this place of torment so they won't have to come here after they die. So this indicates a knowledge in heaven, in the afterlife, about what is happening on earth. And I bring this up because sometimes people say things like, well, you'll be oblivious of what is happening on earth and, and you won't remember anything about what happened on earth. What are you talking about? This guy is aware of the fact that he has brothers that are alive on earth still, and he doesn't want him to end up in this horrible place of judgment that he finds himself in. So when you get to heaven, you don't know less, you know more, right? Because the Bible says that in that day, we will know as we are known, 1 Corinthians 13, 12. We will know as we are known. By the way, that word means to come to know. This indicates that there is still a process of learning in heaven and in the new earth. It's not like you die and go to heaven and all of a sudden, you know everything. You know as much as God knows. No, that's not true. Only God is omniscient, all-knowing. I will keep learning and growing in heaven. In fact, Ephesians 2, 6 says, God has raised us up with Christ and seated us in the heavenly realm, so in the coming ages, he might show the incomparable riches of his grace. And that word show means to reveal. So this phrase, coming ages, indicates there's a progressive, ongoing revelation in which we learn in heaven more and more about the grace of God. Isn't that gonna be exciting? Here's another point, number two. When people believe in Jesus on earth, it's public knowledge in heaven. When people believe in Jesus on earth, it's public knowledge in heaven. In Luke 15, Jesus told three stories of people who lost something. There was a woman who lost a coin. 
There was a father who lost a son, and there was a shepherd who lost a sheep. And in the case of this shepherd, he went searching until he found that stray sheep and brought it back, wrapped around his neck, rejoicing. And then this point is brought there in Luke 15. Jesus says, in the same way, there'll be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people. So know this, when you're engaged in evangelism, this is pleasing the heart of God, and when a person believes in Jesus on earth, there is joy in heaven. But notice it says that there's joy in the presence of the angels of God. Sometimes we'll say, when an unbeliever comes to Christ, the angels rejoice. Well, that's kind of true, but it's not exactly what it says. It says there's joy in the presence of God. Could that verse actually be suggesting that the great joy is not among the angels alone, but it's among us. In other words, is it possible that in heaven, I would be aware that my life or testimony or witness had some impact on someone who had just believed? In other words, I'm in heaven and I know someone that I shared the gospel with just came to faith. Maybe it's my son or my granddaughter or maybe a relative even beyond that or, or someone else, but there's a direct connection between heaven and earth. We think heaven is so far away. Think of it more as a, another dimension that you enter into when you go into the afterlife. So coming back to our text here, now in Revelation 6, we have the martyrs crying out, how long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those that dwell on the earth. Bringing me to my next point, people in heaven may know more about the time and place of events on earth than we realize. Again, people in heaven may know more about the time and place of events on earth than we realized. Who are these people? They're mere mortals. They're people like you and me. They've been put to death for their faith. But they're aware of things. For starters, they're aware that they were killed for following Christ, and they know that was and injustice, so they're the same people in heaven that they were on earth. There's a direct continuity. The martyrs are fully conscious, rational, and aware of each other, aware of God, and aware of what is happening on earth. Also note they're aware of the passing of time on earth. They see in verse 10, how long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood. And then in verse 11, it said to them that they should rest a little while longer. Now I bring this up because sometimes people say, in heaven we're not aware of the passing of time. Why would you say that? These folks who were put to death for their faith are fully aware of the passing of time. Also I would add there's a direct connection between these believers in heaven and those that are still on the earth. They refer to their fellow servants and their brothers. Again, this is connected to these people in particular, but if it's true of them, could it not be true of us? So my point is simply this. Heaven knows more about earth than you realize. Now we come to another part of chapter six. The sixth seal is open, and God's judgment comes to planet earth in full force, and there are cataclysmic events that are happening. They're so big uh, the people are freaking out. Look at Revelation 6, verse 12. And I look and he opened the sixth seal. And behold, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became a sackcloth of hair. And the moon became like blood. And the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it's shaken by a mighty wind. And then the sky receded as a scroll when it's rolled up in every mountain and island uh, was moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave, every free man hid themselves in the caves and the rocks of the mountains. Notice that everyone is affected, the famous and the unknown, the powerful and the weak, the rich and the poor. Verse 16 of Revelation 6. And they said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. 
Verse 17, for the great day of his wrath has come and who is able to stand? These non-believers want to hide from God. They say to the mountains and rocks, fall on us. You know, it said there's no atheists and foxholes. I don't think that's completely true. Uh, there are people that on their very deathbeds will reject God. Of course, there are some that will believe and thank God for his mercy that is extended. What if I'm talking to somebody right now who's on their deathbed and you've done some horrible things with your life and you've made some horrible decisions and you've said things to God that you wish you could take back and you think it's too late for me. It's never too late for you. No matter what sin you've committed, if you will call out to Jesus Christ, he will forgive you. The Bible tells the story of a, what we call the thief on the cross. He actually was guilty of a far more serious crime than theft. He was hanging next to Jesus. He probably was a murderer. And he turns to Christ and says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Listen, no matter what you've done, God will forgive you of your sin and you can have a second chance. And if you wanna know more about that, I'll tell you how in just a few moments. But these people are not turning to God. They're pretty much dying as they have lived. In effect, they're calling out to Mother Nature. They're not saying, God, hide us, or God, forgive us, and even more, God, save us. They're saying, rocks and mountains hide us from this judgment that is to come. Have you ever tried to hide from God? Have you ever tried to run from God? Remember when my grandkids were small, we would play hide and seek, and they hadn't learned the art of deception yet, and they would go and hide like behind the curtains, and I, I would see their feet, and they'd be laughing, and I'd act like I didn't know where they were. Where are you, Allie? Where are you, Lucy, Christopher? And I would find them, and then I'd say, let's do it again, go hide, and they'd hide in the same place. <laughs> That's us hiding from God. You really think you can hide from him? Do you really think you can escape from him? Should you even want to escape from him? The answer is no. The psalmist says in Psalm 139, I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you're there. I can have the darkness to hide me and the light around me to become night, but even in darkness, I cannot hide from you. You can't hide from God. Now the scene closes with the asking of the rhetorical question in verse 17, who is able to stand? And the answer is, no one. Yes, again, I want to emphasize. God will give chance after chance for people to believe even in the tribulation period. But if people end up being judged in this final day, it's on them. It's not on God. He takes no pleasure in this. He doesn't want to do it. But because he is just, he will. Now we come to Revelation chapter seven. Look at verse one. After these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth or on the sea or any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, do not harm the earth and the sea or the trees, so we have sealed the servants of God on their foreheads. Who are these servants of God that will be sealed on their foreheads? We've already, already been introduced to them. We call them the 144,000. Who are the 144,000 spoken of in the book of Revelation? Simple answer, they're not Jehovah's Witnesses. I bring this up because the Watchtower Society uh, says that there are 144,000 Jehovah's Witnesses. They're the fulfillment of this prophecy. Well, that's ridiculous because this hasn't happened yet. This is a future event that will happen in the tribulation period, which has not begun yet. So who, pray tell, are the 144,000? Well, we know they are Jews because they come from the 12 tribes of Israel. And in verses four to eight, you have the specific tribes that they will actually come from, including the tribes of Judah, Asher, and Zebulun. These Jews have embraced 
Jesus as their Messiah. Some might call them Messianic Jews. Call them what you like. These are Jewish people that have embraced the Jewish Messiah and they believe in him. And now God has called them to a special purpose. They're sort of like supercharged, superpowered missionaries combing the planet with the everlasting gospel. It's said of them that they have their own song, which is kind of cool. They have their own song. It's unique to them. It's also said of them that they're spiritually pure. Then later in Revelation 14.4, it is said of the 144,000, they follow the Lamb, that's Jesus. They follow the Lamb wherever he goes. It also is uh, said to us here that no lie is found in their lives and they're blameless. They're sort of like spiritual Superheroes, nothing can stop them. They're literally indestructible and this really ticks off the Antichrist because he wants to stop them, but he cannot. There's a special mark on them that distinguishes them and the Antichrist cannot stop them. And did you know God has put a mark on you? (laughs) Now, when we think of mark, we think of it in a negative way, like the mark of the beast, but There's a good mark. Think of it this way. It's like an ID tag, right? You put your ID tag on your luggage. Like when I go to the airport and I wait for my luggage, it's like everybody has black luggage, right? And a lot of us have luggage probably from the same company. And so it comes down the little belt there and and I've had people walk off with my bag and a couple of times I've walked off with someone else's bag. So Check the ID tag to figure out who the luggage belongs to. You have an ID tag. It says something along the lines of property of the Lord Jesus Christ. He placed that mark on you when you believe. Ephesians 1 says, after you heard the message of truth, that is the gospel, you believed and you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise given as a pledge or a down payment of our inheritance. So God has put his mark on you. Uh, You belong to the Lord. You're the Lord's property. I heard the story of an older man who uh, had walked with the Lord for years and one day he was getting tempted to sin and he prayed, Lord, your property is in danger again. (laughs) So it's a great thing to know that God's ID tag is on you, that you're under the protection of God. But isn't this a stark contrast? because we have those that have the mark of the beast and those that have the mark of the Lord. Listen, if you have the mark of the Lord, no one can stop you. Listen to this. I am indestructible until God is done with me. There's an interesting passage at the end of the Gospel of Mark, chapter 16, where it says of the followers of Jesus, they will take up deadly serpents and they will not be harmed and they can drink deadly poison, and it won't kill them. Now, we've heard about these churches that have services where they hand rattlesnakes uh, around. That's ridiculous. That's not trusting the Lord. That's testing the Lord. And I just read about some preacher that was bit by the rattlesnake and died. It doesn't mean we should be foolish and take unnecessary risks. What it does mean is you're not gonna go before your time. Case in point, Paul the Apostle was shipwrecked on an island and he was warming himself over the fire and we read a venomous snake bit him and we just read he shook it off under the fire. Everyone thought he was gonna die. He just got bit by a venomous snake. He didn't die because God wasn't done with him. By the way, I've been bitten by many snakes and that's because I used to have snakes as a kid. I would go out and catch him in the wild and buy him in pet stores and so many times I was bit, 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 bit by snakes which is not a pleasurable experience, by the way. But I was never bit by a venomous snake. But here's the point. You're gonna go as long as God wants you to go. So don't worry about it. Don't think, oh, what if this is my last day? Well, if it is, it is. And if it isn't, it isn't. But here's what you need to know. You'll go as long as God wants you to go. And when your time has come, you'll be escorted by the angels into the presence of God. So the 144,000 are protected by God because they have his mark. Those that follow the Antichrist have his mark as well. So let me ask you this. If you were alive at this time, whose mark would be on your life, Antichrist or Jesus Christ? Let me bring it into the present moment. 
Whose mark are you carrying right now? The mark of Christ or the mark of Antichrist? Now some of you will push back and say, well, Greg, even you said Antichrist has not appeared yet, so clearly I'm not carrying the mark of Antichrist. Well, in a broad sense, you are either for Christ or you're for Antichrist because Antichrist is not just referring to a man that is coming, also known as the beast and the son of perdition and other phrases that are used. It also speaks of a mentality. For instance, if you deny that Jesus is the son of God, you are Antichrist because 1 John 2.22 says, who is a liar? It's a man who denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a man is Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. Listen to this, when someone professes faith in Jesus and walks away, they're antichrist. First John 2, 18 says, dear children, this is the last hour. And as you've heard, the antichrist is coming, but even now many antichrists have, have come. This is how we know it's the last hour. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they belonged to us, they would have remained with us but their going out showed that none of them belong to us. So if someone professes faith and walks away from Jesus and never returns, they're antichrist. And if someone follows Jesus and falls away and returns, well, they're just a prodigal. That's a lot of people out there. Maybe I'm talking to a prodigal right now, someone that was raised in the church, someone that knows what is right, but you've gone astray and you feel, well, I've gone so far, I could never return. No, you can return. And that will confirm that you belong to Jesus Christ, but if you don't return, it confirms that you are actually anti-Christ. So we should seek to follow the example of the 144,000. Remember, they follow Jesus wherever he goes. They live honest, blameless lives, and they fearlessly proclaim the gospel everywhere. 144,000 of them. It's amazing what one life can do. The story is told of uh, a man who spoke to another young man whose name was Dwight. And he said, Dwight, the world is yet to see what God can do with and through and in the man who is fully committed to him. Well, the young man named Dwight who heard that was also known as Dwight Moody better known as D.L. Moody. And Moody went on to become the greatest evangelist of his generation. One man, I just finished writing a book about Billy Graham. It's called Billy Graham, The Man That I Knew. And it was just amazing for me to revisit his life. It's almost like a Bible story. I mean, it reminds me of Gideon, how the Lord just called this young man to go deliver the Israelites. He was living in obscurity. That was Billy Graham, a farm boy, living uh, with his parents there in North Carolina, getting up really early in the morning to milk the cows. As a young man, he aspired to be a professional baseball player, and God had another plan. An evangelist came to his town and preached under a tent, and, and young, lanky, Billy Frank, as he was called, walked forward and gave his life to Christ. Who would have known that God would use this young farm boy to touch the world? Who would have known that God would have used this unknown boy from North Carolina to be the greatest evangelist in human history? And who knows if I'm not talking to someone right now that could be the next D.L. Moody, the next Billy Graham, the next Corey Tin Boom, the next whoever God wants to use, what God can do in and through a man or a woman who is totally committed to him. Look at what he does to this group of 144,000. So many people come to Christ as a result of their testimony. Revelation 7, 9 says, Behold, a great multitude that no one could number of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues. That may be the largest revival in human history history, so much for the vengeful God that enjoys judging people. This happens in the tribulation period. Let me land this plane now and come back to what heaven knows about earth. These scenes that are happening on earth are viewed in heaven. And right now, heaven is watching. Do you want to make heaven cheer? 
believe in Jesus Christ. And then he will put his mark on you. He will put his ID tag on you. And you will come under his protection. And you will have the absolute assurance that when you leave this life and go to the afterlife, you go into God's presence in heaven. As I said before, we decide in this life where we will spend the afterlife. My question to you is, if you were to die today, where would you go? According to the Bible, there are two destinations, heaven or hell. If you put your faith in Jesus, you go to heaven. If you end up in hell, you have no one to blame but yourself. God is giving you a warning right now. This is your wake-up call. And he's saying, believe in me. He's calling you to himself. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died on the cross for you 2,000 years ago. And he was crucified and he bore your sin. Jesus came to pay a debt he did not owe because we owed a debt we could not pay. But the good news is, is Jesus rose again from the dead three days later, and he's alive. That's right. Jesus Christ is alive, and he's standing at the door of your life wherever you are, and he is knocking. And he's saying, if you'll hear his voice and open the door, he will come in. Would you like him to come into your life? Would you like your sin forgiven? Would you like to go to heaven when you die? Would you like to be ready for the next event on the prophetic calendar known as the rapture? If so, you need to pray and ask Jesus to come into your heart and life right now. In a moment, we're gonna do that. And I'm gonna lead you in a simple prayer. So if you want your sin forgiven, if you wanna go to heaven when you die, if you wanna be ready for the Lord's return or if you're a prodigal and you need to come back home again, pray this prayer with me. You could pray it out loud if you like or you can pray it in the quietness of your heart but just pray this simple prayer after me right now. Pray these words, Lord Jesus. I know that I am a sinner but I know that you are the Savior who died on that cross for my sin and rose again from the dead I turn from my sin now and I choose to follow you from this moment forward. Thank you for hearing this prayer. Thank you for answering this prayer. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Did you just pray that prayer? If so, I wanna just say to you, congratulations and welcome to the family of God. I wanna hope you to grow in your faith and I have a gift for you. It's called the New Believer's Bible. I would like to send this to you at no charge. And basically what it is, is the New Testament in a very friendly translation. It's called the New Living Translation. And it also is filled with hundreds and hundreds of notes that I wrote that will encourage you in this commitment or recommitment you've made to follow Jesus Christ. If you look on the screen right now, there's a phone number. Would you call that number? If so, we'll have someone respond and we'll rush you your own copy of the New Believer's Bible. There's also a little box you can click if you're watching on a computer or a tablet or a phone. I've heard that many of you watch these services on your phone. Just click that little box and I'll send you this same Bible. So our worship group is gonna do a song and I'm gonna have a final statement for you. But right now, call that number on the screen. Click that little box and let us know that you prayed with me to accept Jesus Christ and we'll send you your copy of the New Believers Bible. God bless you as you do that. I'll be back in a moment. Chains fall, fear bow, heal now. Jesus, you change everything. Lies healed, hope found here right now. Jesus, you change everything.
Hey, let me come back to what I, I said a few moments ago. We read about these courageous believers who believed and spoke up for the word of God and for the testimony which they had. Listen, speak up for God's word. Jesus said, don't be ashamed of me before a wicked and an adulterous generation. He said, if you will confess me before people, I'll confess you before my Father and the angels in heaven. But he added, if you deny me before people, I'll deny you before the Father and the angels. Sometimes to not speak up for Christ is to deny him in a way, because you know the truth. Speak up. And then I love how it says the word of their testimony. You have a testimony. Basically, your testimony is how you came to believe in Jesus Christ. And as I said earlier, this is one of the most effective tools in your evangelistic toolbox. Instead of yelling at people and, you know, pounding your Bible, just say, let me tell you about what happened to me, how you came to believe in Jesus. Some testimonies are more radical than others, of course. People were delivered from a life of crime or drugs or all sorts of incredible, horrible things. And others maybe lived a relatively moral life, but the bottom life is everybody needs Jesus. Everybody has sinned. Everybody had to put their faith in him, and that's a testimony. And that connects to someone out there because there's someone out there just like you that needs to hear your story. Stand up for God's word. Give your testimony out boldly. And let's be about our Father's business because we don't know when that moment will happen. In a moment in the twinkling of an eye the dead in Christ will rise first and we which are alive and remaining shall be caught up together with them in the clouds and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Let's walk with him. Let's follow the example of the 144,000. They live lives of purity and they follow the Lord wherever he went. Let's follow Jesus in this coming week. And until next time, God bless you. One more time, Jesus. Jesus, we love.
receive our worship, Jesus. It's for you, God. We are nothing without you, God. We need you, God, more than ever.